Well, good afternoon and welcome to Suffrages on this Saturday of the third week after Epiphany. Thank you for being with me today. The scriptures we're using today are Psalm 122. Uh, we'll start Genesis chapter 18 today and we'll finish Hebrews chapter 10, picking up where we left off yesterday. Uh, but first, before we get into the, the worship, let's have a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us as we come into your presence from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal, we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. <clears throat> Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay. Stop there for our scriptures. Beginning with the Psalm number 122. <clears throat> I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is at unity with itself to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, the assembly of Israel, to praise the name of the Lord. For there are the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and quietness within your towers. For my brethren and companions' sake, I pray for your prosperity. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek to do you good. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, give us the peace of the new Jerusalem. Bring all nations into your kingdom to share your gifts, that they may render thanks to you without end and may come to your eternal city where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. First reading, Genesis chapter 18, we'll read verses 1 through 15. And the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. 
And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf he'd prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. <clears throat> but Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so here we have another, <clears throat> we call this a theophany, an appearance of God. Um, and it seems that God does this with Abraham more than he does with <laughs> most other people in the Bible. He appeared to him. He didn't just speak to him. He appeared to him. Uh, the Oaks of Mamre, this is a, a notable landmark, so they know where this happened. Okay. Um, so... He appeared to him as Abraham sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. So probably not much going on that time of day. So he's probably waiting for it to cool down. Um, three men standing in front of him. All right. Why three? Well, we would say when the Lord appears in the Old Testament, this is the pre-incarnate son of God. This is the second person of the Trinity. Father cannot appear directly to any human being. This is how he explained it to Moses. He would, any regular human being would die, but this, the son can appear. So Bible scholars now believe these three men to be God the Son and two angels with him. Um, yeah, so. So, but... Clearly, Abraham recognizes this as holy visitors, right? He saw them, bowed himself, to, he ran to meet them, bowed himself to the earth. This is an act of worship, right? Fell on his face is another way to say that. Bowed all the way to the ground. Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, don't just pass by, right? If, if there's anything that I've done right, stay a moment, right? Um. So it's it's not uncommon to um, to treat guests with respect and humility, but this goes beyond that, okay? He knows that these visitors are special. He knows that they are divine. He calls him their servant, right? Um, he says, let, let me do this. Let me bring you water so that you can wash your feet, rest under the tree, and feed you. Then, after you have rested and been refreshed, then you can go. Since you have come to your servant, you have come here. There's a reason for that. Let me be your good servant. Let me do something for you out of service. The washing of feet is the first step of proper hospitality. Um and because there were really not a lot of things like inns or hotels, um, people placed high importance on such hospitality. And neglect or mistreatment of travelers was at those times regarded as a great social evil. So he is doing his utmost according to social uh, convention, but he is going above and beyond for these divine visitors. <clears throat> 
Um, so he describes his hospitality as meager. Just I'm just going to bring you a little bit of bread. Well, it's more than bread. It's bread, you know, cakes, right? It's, uh, a, it's the tenderest meat he can offer them, curds, milk. I mean, for a very austere location, you know, and preparing with fire. And I mean, he's living in a tent. He doesn't have a, a full-fledged kitchen like a castle would. So this is a pretty good meal, okay? <clears throat> um, so... Now, he goes in and tells his wife three seahs. So a seah was seven quarts. So 21 quarts of fine flour, that's a lot of bread. <laughs> that's way too much for three men. Um, these cakes would have been round unleavened cakes that they say here resemble may have resembled pancakes. So they were hastily baked on hot stones. Um that could heat up rapidly. So they were cooked really fast. It's probably why they were thin so they could cook faster. Um, right. So he brings this meal out and set it before them and they, and he stood with them while they ate. And then they ask about, Hey, where's your wife? Well, she's in the tent. She was just making this meal. Right. So the Lord repeats his promise about this time next year. I will surely Come back, return to you. And Sarah, your wife, not any other woman, Sarah shall have a son. And now this time she hears it, right? Before, or was it said just to Abraham? Well, probably. <clears throat> Abraham laughed last time. This time Sarah laughed. Why? Because they're old. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. In other words, I think the modern medical term would be she had finished going through menopause, which means she is no longer fertile. She wasn't fertile to begin with. She was described as barren. She had never had children. Now she's 90. She laughed to herself. I'm worn out. My Lord, talking about her husband, my husband is old, right? My husband is old. Shall I have pleasure? Is this going to happen? The Lord said to Abraham, why did she laugh and say this? Is anything too hard for the Lord or too wonderful? Um, <clears throat> the pleasure here is the pleasure of having her own child. There is no greater pleasure for, for a woman than to be a mother. Though she laughed in doubt, she would, we would find out later that she did believe, which we'll read about in Hebrews, not today, but probably tomorrow or Monday. Um, so even for a barren woman to have a child against nature is no difficulty for God just as it was not difficult for God to let a virgin conceive and have a child. At the appointed time, this time next year, I will return to you, and Sarah shall have a son. Shall. Now it is it is a dictate. It is going to happen. But Sarah denied laughing. I didn't laugh, right? And as you can see, the... Um, the other trend the translation note here is or she acted falsely she lied about it she was caught i didn't laugh she was afraid right he said no you did laugh <laughs> she got busted by god himself but so he he's kind the lord is kind to her but he decisively rebukes her no no you laughed right so he didn't he didn't engage his wrath at her but he does tell her I know that you laughed. God knows all. When God makes a promise, he will keep it. And we can believe him. And this is one such story that proves it. And we'll find out that it's true. So um, this is going to be the reading for tomorrow. So, all right, let's move into Hebrews. So today we're... We're still in chapter 10. We're going to finish this chapter starting at verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses 
dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Ooh, I am so sorry. There it is. My soul has no pleasure in him, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so the last few days we've been talking about, <clears throat> about the sacrifice of Christ and how that one sacrifice took the place of the repeated sacrifices of the former high priests, right? And now that we've had that sacrifice and his blood has given us uh, entrance to heaven, the holy places, this is this is heaven now. Um, the curtain has been drawn back because his flesh was drawn back, it's broken. And so now we can come with a true heart and full assurance of faith into God's presence. Our hearts are sprinkled clean, washed with pure water, right? All these things have happened to give us access to the Father. Now, with that sacrifice that has taken away our sin, taken away our, our guilty conscience, that we've been sanctified, but we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Think about that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this describes the sin against the Holy Spirit. A challenging issue of interpretation. Um, think also about Saul and David, both of whom fell into manifest sin and would face God's rebuke and wrath. Sinned, Saul did not repent, but turned away from the Lord. David, when confronted with his sin, did repent. Two different responses to confrontation with their sin. Um Deliberately sinning is persistently doing what we know to be wrong, right? <clears throat> All right, there's a note here. It's, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So it has us going to chapter 6. So I'm going to go back there, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Okay, so the sins we've already committed have been atoned for. <clears throat> and if we repeat them deliberately, knowing that they're a sin, well, then the sacrifice that already paid for them, now it does need a new sacrifice. Boy, that's pretty hard to hear, isn't it? Oof. If we, But if we're committing the sin, knowing it's a sin, and we decide to do it anyway, now we're not even trying to be obedient. That's a problem in God's eyes. 
So there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. What's this here? Yeah, that's chapter six. That's what I read to you. But instead, a fearful expectation of judgment and a fear of fire that will consume the adversaries. Those who deliberately sin against God are God's adversaries. Willfully disobedient to him. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. All right, let's go back to the study Bible here. Treating the law as invalid or spurning it. That's what that means by setting it aside. Like, I don't care about the law of Moses. I don't care about it. It's particularly the Ten Commandments. Doesn't matter to me. Worthless. Don't. That's, that's what we're talking about here. Okay. And let's remember... Uh, all right. Uh, it says there is, don't forget, there is no salvation apart from Christ's sacrifice. Okay. One of the church fathers said this about this verse. He did not say, no more is there repentance or no more is there remission, but no more is there a sacrifice. That is, there is no more a second cross. That's the important part there. Right. So if you're going to, Set aside, treat the law as invalid. Dying without mercy which means means without hope for pardon. Now, Deuteronomy 17, this thing about three witnesses. <clears throat> Let's check that, shall we? Deuteronomy 17. That's going to be um, verse 6. On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of only one witness. Hmm. So, God's lost. The law of Moses has not been eliminated. In Christ, it has been fulfilled but it's still valid, okay? How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Whew. All right. So considering Christ's blood to be common and therefore despising Christ's sacrifice is what it means by profaning it, okay? Um. Uh, God will receive into grace all who repent and believe in Christ, but he will also punish those who willfully despise God's spirit. They will be hardened and blinded and eternally condemned if they persist in such things. That is from our Lutheran confessions. <clears throat> uh, so, we know him who said vengeance is mine. Vengeance is God's. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, which means um, to be at his mercy when you have angered him. Okay. So, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, that is, given the Holy Spirit, especially through conversion and baptism, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Right? That happened to them. And you can read about that in... Philemon, okay? Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those who were treated that way. Not everybody received the gospel well. Some some of these cultures punished the new Christians. You had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your own property, since you, yourse you knew yourselves that you had a better possession and an abiding one, one that lasts, okay? <clears throat> And that possession, that better possession, is the kingdom of heaven. Right? All these earthly things will pass away. Heaven will not. And in Christ, that is our reward. That is our better possession, and it does last. Therefore, because of all this, because you know that, and that you have this better possession, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Luther says they already have the kingdom of heaven, and yet... 
they will have it even more gloriously when it is revealed. Right? You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Right? So keep it up. Don't toss it away. Don't turn aside from God and the path he's set you on. Confessing the gospel is doing the will of God. You do this through a, day, through a godly life and steadfast faith. That is doing the will of God. Yet a little while, the coming one will come and will not delay. He will. How long is a little while? Only the Father knows. But my righteous, my righteous one, the righteous person shall live by faith. Okay, this is in Romans and Galatians. Where else are we talking about here? A couple other places that refer to this. Isaiah 26, Haggai 2, Luke 18. My righteous one will live by faith. Sounds like Abraham, doesn't it? His, he had faith, Abraham had faith, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. If he shrinks back, like steps away from the life of faith, God's soul has no pleasure in him, right? But we, this church, are not the kind who shrink back and then are destroyed. But we are those who have faith and preserve our souls. That's who we are. This church that's listening. And God, God willing, you and me too. Okay. All right, and we'll pick up there, I think, on Monday. Let's conclude. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray you, so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Lord bless you, defend you from all evil, and bring you to everlasting life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that concludes our responsive prayer, also known as suffrages for this Saturday. Thank you for spending this time in the word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, tomorrow's the last Sunday of the month, which means noisy offering. So bring your pocket full of change, please. Hope I can see you tomorrow. And then we'll get back to uh, our devotions next week. I'm sorry for the delay today. Not too bad, but... Um, yeah, just little little adjustments here and there. Still getting back into the swing of things. So, so again, I appreciate you being here. Thank you. I wish you a blessed rest of your Saturday and of your weekend. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.